Okay, so thanks for being on this program with us, Honorable Minister. Um, would like to know a little bit about yourself. This is the PWP series, and uh, would like to know a little bit about your story. Okay, so um, where do I start? <laughs> Maybe you can start from childhood. My parents were both medical doctors. Um, I was born in Hungary, which is where my parents went to medical school. They met us as students. I lived in Hungary till I was about um, two and a half years old. And then we moved to the UK. And we lived in the UK till I was about nine. And then we came back to, we came back to Ghana. Um, in Ghana, my, I attended primary school at the University Primary School in Cape Coast for about two years. And then um, I did the common entrance and I, I got admission into Wesley Girls. I attended Wesley Girls High School in Cape Coast from Form 1 to Upper 6. Then I um, entered the University of Ghana in 1986. I studied law. At that time, we were doing the Bachelor of Laws degree as an undergraduate course. So I studied law for three years. And then after that, I went to the Ghana School of Law and I did the professional law course for two years. I did my national service after um, law school with the International Federation of Women Lawyers as a legal aid officer. As a matter of fact, I did national service twice because um, at the time I completed sixth form, we did one year of national yeah, service national before service university. So I did the one year of national service before university as a court clerk at the Cape Coast High Court. Interesting. And then, because I knew I wanted to study law. Okay. And I wanted to have a practical understanding of what the legal pressure, the legal profession would involve. And then, as I said, after I finished um, law school, then I did legal aid with the International Federation of Women Lawyers. Once I had finished my national service, I started private legal practice at Ansar and Co. And worked there till about um, 1995. Yes, 1995, when I, um, I joined the Commission on Human Rights and Administrative Justice as a legal officer. I worked there for less than a year. And then I joined um, Ghana Agro Food Company Limited as a legal counsel. And I worked with that company in various positions until the year 2000, when I decided to contest for elections um, as a member of parliament for, then it was called the Aoutu Senior constituency, on the ticket of the National Democratic Congress. I was member of parliament for four years, and I decided not to contest again at that time. And um, went back to private practice. And then in the 2008 uh, election campaign, I became the communications director for President Mills' uh, campaign and for the party, for the National Democratic Congress. We won the election. Immediately after the election, I became the spokesperson for the government as it was in the process of forming. And then once that process was over, I was nominated and was approved after vetting to be the Minister for Trade and Industry. I was Minister for Trade and Industry till um, for the entire duration of, of uh, that term. And then after President Mahama I won the 2012 elections in 2013, I was appointed Foreign Minister. And so that is where I have come from, where I've come from, and what I've been through. Now I'm I'm intrigued. Let, let's start first with the law, because lately I've noticed that there's a big trend where everybody is trying to be a lawyer. A lot of people are going to law school. Why law? Well, in the first place, I wanted to go to university to do a profession, okay. not just to read subjects. I felt I wanted to um, study a profession, and when I had read around 
doing law, I realized that there were a lot of opportunities with a legal background. You could either decide to be a practicing lawyer, or the skills that the law gives, learning the law gives you could be useful skills for several other um, careers and occupations. And so I thought it gave me a broad enough um, set of choices that I would study law. And once I, I got admission to the University of Ghana to the law faculty and after the first year, you know, in those days we had to do, after the first year exam, the first 40 were invited to read Bachelor of Laws. The next 20 were invited to read Bachelor of Arts with Law. And anybody who didn't make that 60, 60. dropped law and then studied the other two wow. subjects that they had wow. decided to read on, on entering university. Wow. And you obviously made the first 40 cut. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> OK, so now I'm interested in the communication, because cause that's something I've noticed that you have a natural flair for. How did you get into being, becoming such an eloquent speaker and um, get you to the point where you actually asked to be the communication director? And I've heard in different seminars where you've been commended on your eloquence and your ability to retain. Can you tell me how that came about? Well, I've always liked reading. Okay. I mean, as a child, I, I'd, I'd read anything and everything, whether it was fiction, whether it was at those times, news magazines, which, you know, I may not have understood the concepts, but I still read them anyway. Okay. Um, newspapers, um, literally anything I could get my hands on. So by the time I was age eight, I was reading, I mean, I had read Black Beauty by the age of eight. Wow, I remember that. That was a horse, right? Yes. Yes, I remember Black Beauty. And um, Heidi and... Um, uh, Jane has, some of Jane has yeah. books and, and all of that. So, I very early in the day, I, I acquired a habit of reading, which I still have. And the good thing about reading a lot is that, of course, not only does it introduce you to so many different characters and events and places through the written word, but it also gives you a very wide range of vocabulary. And so, being able to say what I wanted to say in the words I wanted to use from that age onwards wasn't particularly difficult. But I don't think that I ever made an effort throughout primary school or secondary school or even in university to be um, a speaker of, of, of any kind. I don't remember um, making any presentation or or giving a speech, but there was one event which my my classmates still tease me about today. This was in Form 2 in the English language class. We'd been given an assignment to write an essay about something, and I hadn't, writ I hadn't written it. And then the teacher asked me to um, get up and read my essay in front of the class. And I wasn't about to tell her that I hadn't done I hadn't it. Done it. <laughs> so I made it up as I went along. And then, so she asks me, can you repeat that? Oh my and goodness. I'd go, no, I said exactly what I said. <laughs> <laughs> so I think everybody was convinced that I had done it, but she had noticed that throughout the period, I hadn't turned the page. Mm -hmm. And indeed, I was staring at two blank sheets of paper. So then she asks me to bring my book. Oh my goodness. And then she turns it to the rest of the class and there's wow. nothing. <laughs> <laughs> there's nothing written there. So I suppose that that was the first event that taught me that if I really had to, I could. Uh, yeah. But as I said, I didn't really make any efforts, or neither was I in a situation where I had to 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 speak or to try and convince anybody or or anything of that nature. But when it comes to being able to organize my thoughts and put ideas across, I think the legal training helps in that a lot. Because one of the things that you learn early in the day when you are studying law is how to brief cases. You have to read these cases from these law reports that are sometimes hundred and something pages long. And you have to narrow it down to what were the main facts, what were the issues to be decided, 
and what were the holdings, the conclusions. And it's that summary, facts, issues, holdings, that you use to prepare your case brief so that, of course, you can remember the case as a reference and as an authority. And you brief hundreds of cases as you are studying law because literally for every particular topic in every subject that you are studying, there are several authorities to be able to support particular principles. But that practice of case briefing really helped me to organize my thoughts, to learn how to organize my thoughts, and to focus on the most important things in any correspondence or any document that I read, and to you know quickly be able to cut out what were more descriptive and not necessarily, even though they enhanced the understanding of what was what had been written, did not necessarily need to be added in order to understand the core of the point that was being made. And then getting to practice law and now having to be an advocate and standing before a judge and going ahead to argue your case is also a very good training for summarizing the main facts and being able to put your points across, whether it's in the process of um, addressing the court, whether it's in the process of moving emotion. So I think that really it was the legal training that helped me to improve my skill and my ability to communicate. And I guess it's a combination of all of those things that has allowed me to be able to speak the way I do today. Well, you obviously have a lot of experience, both from private and uh, public service. For young ladies out there and even gentlemen out there who want to generally want to make a difference in their country uh, whether in school now or just starting off their career what advice would you give them uh, to ensure that they can they can build first of all the type of background that makes a difference and they can actually impact changing government what I think is that when you work hard and you put in your best, people notice. You might not necessarily be receiving the kind of salary that you want to have. You may not have everything that you think you deserve for the work that you are doing. But if you are consistent at it and your output is good, people will see that you are good at what you do. And when you are good at what you do and you are able to help to solve problems, and people have problems, they invite you to help them to solve it. And the more you are able to step up to the plate and contribute, the more responsibility you are given. The more responsibilities you are given, the more opportunity you have. True. And how you then convert those opportunities depends on how you see your career progression. But it, it doesn't come easily. It doesn't come by sitting and waiting for it to happen. You've got to, to work at it. And sometimes it's very tedious and sometimes it's very thankless. You know, because you feel like you're putting in so much effort and nobody is noticing. But if you get personal satisfaction out of having done something well, and you know that you've done it well, even if it's not recognized that day, at some point in time it will be. And so you've, you've, I think that what you've got to do is that you've got to work at it, you've got to stay focused, and you've got to keep at it. But don't check on taking additional responsibility. Because if you're just going to stick to your own narrow box in terms of what your job is, what your assignment is, you walk a very narrow career path. You walk the natural progression for that particular position. All right? And you probably walk it quite slowly. But if you are willing to do other things as well and be open-minded about it, you will find out that other opportunities and other doors open for you and it's for you to decide whether you want to take advantage of them or not. Okay. Well, thank you very much for spending time with us and uh, thank you for all this advice. Uh, you've been watching the Breakfast Series. We've been here with Honorable Minister for Foreign Affairs and Regional Integration. And that's it. Thank you.